Super Computing Asia 2025 here in Singapore. And with me today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Dr. Rajiv Hasra, all the way from the uh, United States, if I understand, uh, with uh, Continuum, who's going to be sharing with us the latest uh, developments in this exciting area of quantum. So thank you so much for your time today, Raj. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. It's awesome to be here. I know a lot of uh, activities going on at this uh, conference. And, um, you know, uh, when it comes to quantum technology, a lot of, I think, the audience will be mm, quite surprised to find that, in fact, uh, quantum technology is uh, somewhat embedded in our digital infrastructure already, right? From transistors to GPS systems to um, laser printers. But I think the next natural question for many is because this uh, phenomena is so invisible to the naked eye, how does it work? How do you explain that you know, to the general public? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been in classical computing for 30 years and it's always been a mystery to me till I got more into it. Um, and it's really simple. You know, nature computes, right? If you think about it, uh, it uses natural tools like atoms and, and particles that you find in nature, and they have an inter interaction, and you can control that interaction and get um, a new way to compute instead of semiconductor chips turning on, turning off transistors and, and representing arithmetic or knowledge. You can do that with loading natural elements like atoms, like trapped ions, like light photons uh, with information and what, uh, controlling the interaction to actually cause computation to happen. Well, it just sounds like one more thing, but why do you care, right? The, the reason you care is this kind of computing is very, very promising for uh, speed ups and energy conservations. You can do many, many more things in parallel. Um, with far less energy than scaling today's technologies. And so for some of the really big problems we have to solve, yet to solve, we will need this kind of technology in a very mature state to be able to solve those problems at scale. Mm. I'd like That's to come to those, right, okay. I'd like to come to the one, some of these uh, problems later. Okay. But I think uh, when you talk about quantum speed ups, right, a lot of people, and also you mentioned very briefly during your keynote, uh, this concept of entanglement, right? Entanglement, superposition, I think these are kind of the concepts that go along with uh, the quantum speed up when we talk about quantum computing. So yeah. what, what do they mean? So it's, it's very interesting, you know, when we, when we think of classical computing and speed ups, it's one chip working twice as fast or four times as fast. In, in quantum, there are certain problems that we can get 30,000, 40,000 times more speed up than say a classical, right? There are certain algorithms, uh, we've talked about one called random circuit sampling where it would take millions of, of years on a classical computer, on the fastest classical computer to solve that problem again because we have that power of parallelism in quantum uh, that is somewhat artificially created and engineered in classical systems. Uh, but, there's, but the real exciting thing, Jane, is not so much A versus B speed up, is what can you do that you couldn't do before you had quantum computing, right? Because quantum computers can now represent things, as you said, things we don't see but they represent naturally those phenomena that occur in nature, and so as a result, by doing them on a quantum computer, you can now model them. This is what supercomputers do all the time. They model things with partial differential equations or other forms of uh, you know, mathematics. Quantum computers naturally represent, and, and it's called quantum phenomena, that they encapsulate and represent what's happening in nature. So you can now model things that are happening in nature, then you can start understanding and predicting what it will do or even modifying them. So you can create new kinds of molecules. You can create you know, entirely new kinds of states of matter sometimes, if you will, uh, like we did on our H2 supercomputer. So it is a very promising new land, which is like you take a microscope and you train it on something and you see details that you had never seen before. Right, okay, some of these simulations you pointed out are in molecular science, and also I think you pointed out in your presentation as well, uh, chemical science, uh, financial simulations, environmental simulations, so a lot of different types of applications. So how do we know which ones are suitable for quantum? Because obviously, I guess uh, there are some that are not quite suitable. Yeah, typically things that have a fair amount of parallelism in them, Mm -hmm. uh, are very suitable um, 
for quantum kind of computing, right? But we don't look at quantum replacing classical computers. So we don't say, if this worked well on classical computers, can this work? There are certain things like the work we do on transformer technology, right, which is how generative AI agents work and say, can we replace a certain portion with a quantum algorithm and get speed up at, and, and energy savings? But what we really want to do is say, what can quantum add that you couldn't have had with classical computing and therefore be able to do things that you wouldn't have been able to do or you would have been able to only come close to it with lots of trial and error that is essentially a lot of use of energy and a lot of time. Uh, you, you, I think you brought up this concept of hybrid computing as well in your presentation. Uh, Hi, hybrid computing. Yes, so it. basically complement, using quantum to complement classical, yes, we right? we see the future, at least for, the, for a fair amount of time, being, and maybe forever, actually being the best of classical computers, doing what they do well, working with quantum computers where they don't do as well, and solving problems more efficiently from a resource perspective, or solving problems that could not have been solved before. And I think another question that uh, the audience normally have is, you know, we hear about all these super cooling computers and uh, quantum computers, but obviously there are different types of quantum computers and Quantinium uh, specialize or focus on tri ions, which you also pointed out very yeah. briefly. Yeah. Can you tell us about these different types of computers? Yeah, just as I said, quantum computers are built with things that are found in nature, right? So some people use lights or photons, some people use superconducting elements that they create. Some people use neutral atoms. We use trapped ions, or we use ions as the basic, which is charged atoms. What we found is we have the best of fidelities. So these are um, qubits, if you will, that, that have very high fidelities, and we can scale them. So we can actually build larger and larger quantum computers that are, that are increasingly more reliable, and therefore be able to solve problems faster than the other modalities. Mm -hmm. Today we have the world's most powerful quantum computer called H2. And um, if I had a, you, you can see the H2 in the boot, oh, right, right okay. there, the right trap, right. and how it works. A and then in 18 months, as I said, we are bringing out Helios at the second half of 2025 that will be a trillion times more powerful than H2. So there are different modalities, Everybody's trying to get more scale. Everybody's trying to make the qubits more reliable. We are years ahead of others. So when we hear about all these uh, high profile news, you know, um, this uh, company creating 100 plus qubit com quantum computers, this other company creating 1,000, you know, the number of qubits is just one matrix, isn't it? It's like you, you, you just mentioned about the fidelity, that's very important yeah. as well. Number of qubits, without keeping high fidelities is not very useful. Because what you have to do is increase the number of high fidelity qubits. And in order to do that, you have to pay a lot of attention to not just what the qubit is, but how the qubit is architected in a system. How much connectivity, like can, can each qubit talk to every other qubit? How do you minimize errors? So these become very interesting differentiators, even though Two companies may say, we are using the same kind of qubit. Mm. So we, we just talked about quantum computers, but obviously hardware is just one component of the quantum speed up. You need, uh, as you mentioned earlier, all these are different uh, use cases, right? Uh, rely on algorithms as well, software. Can you talk a bit about you know, the progress in terms of um, where we need to get to in order to marry the software with the hardware to give us that quantum speed up? You're absolutely right. There's no point building hardware if there's no algorithms running on them. Um, that, that area has seen tremendous progress as well. If you take a look at quantum chemistry, for instance, right? we have a tool called Enquanto, and that, Im that includes almost all the basic recipe tools that you, you would use to apply computational chemistry on a quantum machine. Right? Uh, similarly, there's quantum Monte Carlo in you know, simulation, there's quantum natural language processing. So we are looking at and have tools for quantum versions of many of these very standard algorithms that you use today. Quantum Fourier transform, for instance, that is used in signal processing. Those have made good progress and they're only going to progress faster as the hardware gets more capable. And so 
people who focus on writing algorithms are going to see more and more capable hardware as a reason to write these algorithms and right. make them more targeted um, and more effective. And we also provide developer tools. Our ticket tool, which is a developer tool, helps people take the drudgery out of writing algorithms, right? Like optimizing the, the, the program or the circuits as we call it. Um, so our focus on open sourcing developer tools as well as building these high value, what we call primitives for, for a large number of algorithms is going very well and it's going even faster now with better hardware on, to run on. Right, so hardware, software, and of course uh, we need talent and you know, skills yes, as well, absolutely. right? And as part of that, uh, you also mentioned in your keynotes as well, uh, the partnership on working with the Singapore government in terms of you know, uh, setting up research centers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, training. Uh, can you tell us a bit about sure. some of these collaborations? Yeah, the, the, we are very excited about this collaboration. We identified there's only about three places in the world where if you're focused on computational biology, they have the data sets and the basic data to actually do some very interesting science on everything ranging from disease progression to synthetic chromosomes, gene therapy, um, those kinds of things that lead to the future of things like personalized medicine or increasing longevity or even self-healing systems, human systems. Um, and so we are very, very excited to be here. Uh, we see the collaboration as Singapore's data plus expertise plus our expertise in quantum computing and AI bringing together a wonderful way to address some of these large science problems and also get them out to be used by the industry. And so we see this as helping Singapore become a leader in the region uh, for many of these use cases. We see it impossible to do with at a distance. So we are committed to being in Singapore and our research presence and growing that presence. For quantum, one of the most scarce resources today is trained manpower. Yes, yeah. And so for our commitment is to grow that manpower, uh, human power, if you will, um, so that the, the future of quantum computing can be accelerated by ready availability of talent versus be inhibited by it. We think Singapore with its educational system, mm. as well as the talent that comes in from different parts of the region is an amazing place to do that. So we are very excited to announce a research center here that we will start in 2025 and then ramp um, in subsequent years that will become collaborators with the e excellent research in the Singapore ecosystem. I know predictions is very hard, but when do you see you know, the first signs of, uh, when, when can we expect the first signs of you know, practical benefits? Uh, in 2025, we are working on products uh, that you will see being used to ch start changing the way certain discoveries are made using AI and quantum computing. So this is not about 5, 10, 15 years away. Okay. Many companies who say that, it's because they don't have hardware that can actually work before 5 or 7 years. We've had our, this is, we are on our third generation of quantum computers. And so with the software and the hardware we have, we have a clear path to 26, we will have 100 logical qubits, that's a huge tipping point for a large number of applications. So we see it in the next two to three years, right. large scale economic value creation starting to happen All right, okay. through the use of hybrid classical and quantum computing. All right, okay. I think uh, one of the last questions that I'd like to ask is, you know, um, how does uh, quantum, com the recent achievements, right, um, from hardware to software to training, uh, putting resource into manpower training, how would you see that uh, changing or transforming the way that we think about computing? It's, a, it's an excellent question, right? I mean, I think what, we, um, what quantum computing does is extends human aspiration. Mm. You know, many of the problems we talk about today, we've been talking about for the last 20 years. I've been in supercomputing for at least 20, and I know those were being asked about, like how do you model an entire combustion engine? How do you do climate modeling at very fine scales, like 10, meet, 10 feet by 10 feet, right? Those have always been aspirational. These kinds of tools like quantum computing advances help us realize those aspirations. I think it makes society more optimistic. It makes it more productive. It makes it more effective. 
And, and I think it just drives that treadmill of innovation and human endeavor to improve lives for all that much faster. Right, and there's uh, one this uh, video that you played uh, during your keynote presentation that I really liked, and it talks about how quantum is transcending space and time. And it's probably not a topic that we can delve into uh, for today, but uh, you know, I, I love to get your thoughts on you know, these uh, sort of sci-fi topics of time travel and teleportation, right? Yes. But uh, potentially something that we can look forward to in, I don't know, next decade or so. It, uh, oh. I can't exactly tell you how many years, but it'll be sooner than what we imagined today. Oh, wow, okay. That is what we've proven out over right. the course of decades now. If we imagine things, it usually happens sooner than that. Oh, f fabulous. I, I, I can't wait for the day that we can do time travel and redo this podcast. <laughs> Certainly beats flying on airplanes. Uh, yeah, it? right, okay. So thank you so much, uh, Raj, for your time today. That was fascinating. Thank you, Jane. Thank, thank you. you Jane.